That's it, we're live. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I am tickled uh, on this evening to share Praxis Circle Network with uh, some of the finest people I know in Christendom. And um, we're looking forward to um, even going deeper on this evening. Uh, but let me say hello to you uh, and our viewing audience and uh, give a few more uh, opportunity to come in uh, the room to be with us uh, on tonight. And while we're waiting, let me just share um, a testimony of my one, two, three, third uh, grandson graduating from high school yesterday. Uh, and he's on his way uh, to school downstate. Uh, and uh, congratulations, Jalen uh, DeMar Clark again for following the instructions of your family and making us all proud of you. With that being said, let me also um, stop now and welcome some of the finest men in Christendom, as I said earlier, onto Praxis Circle Network. Uh, brothers who are offering themselves uh, as candidates for bishop in the life of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, thus far, we have uh, three of them on, um, presiding elder Harris Lester uh, of the first Episcopal district, presiding elder Philip Washington of the third Episcopal district and presiding elder Griffin of the fourth Episcopal district, brothers beloved, uh, and of course to uh, Dr. Wallace, who's sitting by, uh, one of our guests on this evening, all dressed in Delta colors and pearls. Welcome, doctor. Thank you for being here with us uh, on the, this evening. As you know, a viewing audience, we are a safe place. Praxis Circle is a safe place for people of all ethnicities to come and share uh, with us in reference to uh, their joys and concerns. And so on this evening, I ask five of our candidates, male candidates for bishop to come on and share uh, with us uh, some questions around uh, social justice as we take a leap to honor them at the same time uh, for Father's Day. And I must say that um, there there's nothing like an African-American man. Uh, he comes tall, short, heavy, plump, with hair, no hair, strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, blueberry like mine. Um, so there's nothing like an African-American man and when God decided, uh, indulge me just for a minute. When God decided to allow God's son to come to earth, he chose the color of the African-American man uh, to come and share uh, his journey on earth to revolutionize, if you will, the earth uh, with us. And so, 
when I say the African-American man is special, he's all the way special, all the way from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth because God wrapped himself in the likeness of a black man and came and shared himself uh, with us on earth. In other words, Jesus revolutionized human society and freed, yes, even the woman. <laughs> For before then she was property as uh, Dr. Uh, Bailey reminded us earlier today on timely wisdom that um, in the Hebrew text, a woman is considered property, but However, when Jesus came, he brought liberation for the sister as well. And I'd like to say um, um, this evening, we have um, four of our guests uh, that also believe in revolutionizing our church. I'm waiting on uh, one more person, but um, while we're waiting on him, let me just say that I, uh, I stop with, um, Dr. Griffith, all three of the presiding elders were on. And now we have uh, Dr. Uh, Ricky Halton uh, on, who is a fourth generation CME uh, brother in the life of the church. We are so glad to have him on and we are yet waiting for Dr. Wayne Williams. Um, Dr. Griffin, and uh, Dr. Charlie Haynes switch spots on tonight. So thank you, Dr. Griffith, for your flexibility uh, with Dr. Haynes. Uh, with that being said, let me uh, wish uh, you gentlemen a happy Father's Day. I pray that your Father's Day will be as good as Roger's that is going to be. <laughs> and if you don't know who Roger is, that's my husband. Um, I'm going to make sure that he has a good home cooked meal. Some of uh, the items that I know he loves. And uh, we just uh, believe in the Lord uh, that we're going to give him honor. But scripture says, give honor to whom honor is due. And uh, I'm going to be honoring him uh, on this coming Sunday, along with our blended family of children. Uh, with that being said, um, let me ask, uh, tell our viewing audience, if you would like to be a blessing to Praxis Circle Network, um, all you have to do is go there on our page and you can see all of the apps uh, uh, that are there and you can uh, bless this ministry. Uh, this ministry is one that God gave me uh, after I retired in 2019 to develop a safe haven, a safe place for persons to uh, come and articulate and share uh, their visions as to where we need to go in Christendom in the future. And so tonight again, I invited these gentlemen that are um, uh, hoping to fill the three slots that, um, three vacancies that's coming up in 2022 um, at the head of our church to serve a district, to be um, the head person, the head administrator of three of the districts of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. And they all have uh, served, uh, over 20 years in the life of the church, um, though their age is different, they've all served over 20 years. And um, they come to this platform wondering what in the world is Clark George gonna ask of us tonight? But let me just say brothers, I know you can handle it and it's nothing that you have not heard before. And so we just give God the glory for you, first of all, committing to come and keeping your word uh, to show up so that the people uh, can come and listen to you and go back and listen to you because we're live on Facebook, we're on YouTube, and of course, you know, we're on Zoom. 
And uh, when the sisters came on in, in March, they got a lot of attraction, a lot of traction from being on. And there were over 6,000 folk who viewed that setting. And so uh, don't let anyone tell you we're a little small uh, pawn over here. We got a nice size viewing audience. And so with that being said, uh, again, I'm humbled that you're here. And I want to start with one question that I'm going to ask the four of you. Generally, I will not ask the four of you the same question. So I know you've had your Starbucks and you're ready to roll with me on this evening. But the first general question I want to ask is a question that uh, the Timely Wisdom Sisters uh, asked me uh, when I shared with them a few weeks ago. Um, and I've reworded their question. I didn't want to pleasurize, so I reworded the question that they asked me. And it is, in what way uh, are ways, what way are ways have you as pastor nurtured your congregation during the pandemic of 2020? And I believe I will start with you, uh, presiding elder Paris Lester. In what way or ways have you nurtured your congregation, your congregation now? And if you don't pastor, uh, let's, uh, let's put it this way, your district during the pandemic of 2020. Yes, sir. Thank you so very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Essie Clark George, uh, my big sister in ministry. Thank you for this opportunity into the Praxis Circle Network. Uh, I think the, the short answer for me of how we've been able to get through this pandemic and nurture them is really the pandemic just taught us to kind of go back to some of the, the old fashioned ways. I think it was a part of our quadrennial theme going back to the basics of uh, making those phone calls, checking in on people. Uh, for those who could, I would drive by and go by and visit people, even coming outside, making those personal touches uh, that kind of helped nurture. And also with our young people, uh, they were able to really help the church get online and do uh, Zoom and Facebook and YouTube. But with them also having that time to just speak to them, go by and see them at school. Uh, and many of those who didn't have a chance to go to school, we were able to have a, uh, a partnership with the YMCA where many of the essential workers brought their children to our church every day, Monday through Friday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So it allowed me to have opportunity to be with students and parents to help nurture them through this pandemic. All right, thank you very much. Um, let me move to uh, Dr. Uh, Ricky. Yes, thank you um, for uh, the question. Um, we've been doing a plethora of things during the pandemic. Um, first of all, we've always had virtual services. Uh, we stream live through YouTube, um, we do Facebook and we, uh, uh, do live streaming every Sunday. So we kept staying in people's homes and we still are. And we are advancing even more with more up-to-date equipment. Second thing I like to suggest and say that we have done, I think very successfully. Um, I have always been an advocate of something that many semi churches have cast by the wayside and that's class leader system. We've had regular class leader meetings almost on a monthly basis. My associate pastor, Reverend Yvette Henderson, is, is my uh, class leader of all class leaders. So once a month here recently, particularly, we get together every month and I hear everyone's class and the leaders of the class um, tell me exactly what's going on in the church. So there's not uh, anything, if someone has a toothache, I'm gonna hear about it uh, during my monthly meeting. 
And that's not something that just started. Uh, I've been doing that for the last, um, I don't know how many years, when I was pastor in my last church, um, as Reverend Griffin can attest, because he's the pastor there now, uh, the class leader system was very uh, active when I left, and we just uh, reinforced it when I got to where I am now. So that's one thing that we've done. Uh, I've attended many birthday parties and uh, other rite of passage celebrations. I really believe in rite of passages. Uh, in the black community, we have celebrated rite of passages for, for eons. So I've tried to attend as many uh, birthday celebrations as possible. Um, I have a varied congregation, so we've had quite a few funerals. And uh, so I've not been able to touch people, but uh, even during funerals, I tell all my local preachers, you can kill yourself if you don't handle a funeral correctly. So I have been purposeful in how I deal with funerals and very, uh, very much intentional about how I deal with funerals. And the other last thing I like to say is that uh, we interact. We have a very active Sunday school uh, of about 50 to 60 every week. Um, so uh, I've been on Sunday school um, and even this coming Sunday, we have a very interactive service and we don't do Zoom, but we are having a Zoom service this coming Sunday on Father's Day. And the whole church is gonna participate in a Zoom worship service and it's going to be very interactive. So that's just a few things that we've been doing. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Washington. Thank you, uh, Dr. S.E. Clark George for this opportunity to be here on this evening as well. Let me just add on and piggyback to what uh, Elder Lester and uh, Pastor Helton has said. Uh, one of the things that we've been excited about during this pandemic is that we've been able to reach more people than we would have on Sunday morning. Uh, when the pandemic first started, we encouraged persons to, uh, first of all, we start off with, with conference call services in some of our churches, and then we moved to the Zoom. Uh, so we had to engage our uh, young adults and, and older adults to work with our seasoned saints to learn how to use the Zoom platform. So it became a part of where it became energizing ministry where we were interacting with one another. So we had persons that would go into the homes and work with our uh, seniors and help them to use the platform of Zoom and where they could see persons because when you're kind of distant that way and you can't see one another like you used to on Sunday morning, it can bring about a depression. So this helped us to keep persons encouraged where they could see one another and smile and even have our worship services where they could participate. Uh, so we continue to have uh, Bible studies, uh, prayer lines, Sunday schools, worship services, and we even at one point we had a, a, a district-wide uh, communion service where we had our bishop come in, and on Sunday morning we all were in service together by Zoom, a conference, or by phone, and we had a wonderful event where we had a wonderful worship experience where our bishop was the preacher, where we all took um, communion together, all of our churches across the whole state of Michigan. We had over 350 persons in attendance on Zoom. Uh, so again, we just we were thankful to God for that. So during the pandemic, we made sure that there was an energy about it. It was more than just about coming to a building because we realized it was not about the building. It was always about our relationship with God. So we found a way to continue to encourage persons, uh, even though we weren't physically meeting. But during the Zoom and other uh, media communications, we were able to keep services going. People became energized. We've had persons to join our congregations. Uh, we had people all the way from Sweden and other, other countries even to be a part of some of, the, some of the worship services in our district. So again, it was an outstanding time. And then persons became more familiar with the platform of Zoom uh, so that uh, they got on and they would they used to just use the telephone, but now they come on and they would be viewed. And at the end of every service, I would tell them, okay, now open up your cameras because it's better to be seen than to be viewed. So, you know, we just had a wonderful time of fellowshipping, even during this time of the pandemic. So, again, it was keeping the, the uh, camaraderie, the fellowship going, as well as providing spiritual enrichment for the persons. Uh, we had educational classes for our young people. Uh, so this pandemic didn't slow us down. It just helped us to expand our territory. Very good. Dr. Griffin, talk to us. Well, first, let me say how honored I am to be with you, Dr. S.C. Clark George. It's a pleasure yes, to be here with you and your team. And uh, I guess I would answer this question 
in three ways. First, on my humanity, I went in the house and closed the door. Like God told the children of Israel, put that blood on the gates and stay inside. Let me do my work. In other words, I sat where they sat. I called, saw how they were feeling, talked to them about their families and the welfare. Uh, I listened to their fears and their hopes. And as we sat together, then we became more relational, more understanding of each other's uh, aspirations and, and, and that sort of thing. So in that way, you know, as we talked about their loved ones that were in nursing homes where uh, COVID-19 was wrecking havoc, we talked about those who were entering the hospital. And then when they discovered that I had family members who had uh, contracted COVID and how that had sort of uh, stumped me <laughs> and how I was in prayer. And, uh, and so we talked about the nature of faith and what it really means to live in faith during such a pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I did remind them that this is not the first pandemic that has ever come on the earth and that the same God that was there then is here with us now. So humanly from person to person sitting with them, not physically, but telephonically through cards, through messages, emails and that sort of thing. And uh, then I wanna answer it uh, biblically we continued to teach well really we continued worship shortened of course because of the zoom platform but we discovered a new ministry and that was a sunday school ministry uh, that we began to do on youtube uh, each week and email to the members and others who were interested in sunday school so we developed an active sunday school ministry on youtube and for those of the church who wanted to get on the platform, they could, otherwise they could just uh, click on the YouTube on the email and do Sunday school in that way. So we continued with worship, but one thing about worship, it became more lay ministry driven than mm -hmm. pastor driven. Uh, those who would not ever participate in worship all of a sudden became interested and so we even now do worship together with the lay leaders and other members of the church. And of course, we also, when we go to the nursing home, now that they're open and we sit uh, across from the barrier of our senior citizens and they begin to tell their stories, we chronicle them. We have provided gifts for those in the nursing homes. Uh, one of our ladies that uh, Pastor Helton knows, Sister Viola Wiley, does arts and crafts and she distributes those throughout the nursing home and for her friends in the community and we would take her the materials and she would always have a, a bunch of stuff that she has created for us to take back to the church bookmarks and, mm -hmm. and uh, Kleenex holders all types of things and so we we just became more uh, compassionate all right. and, 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 and really in love and then not only uh, humanity or humanly and biblically, I would say spiritually, as I have processed my trauma uh, through this pandemic, through this pandemic, I had a sister who contracted AIDS and two of her children contracted AIDS. And I, I had a brother who passed recently. Uh, all of these things that have caused me to reevaluate Mm -hmm. uh, my theology mm -hmm. and to go back and uh, update my theology through continuing education courses uh, that you can take with universities and uh, biblical schools. I've taken several with DTS and I've taken uh, some with the uh, Lutheran uh, right. seminary and others that I just do. You can get them for free on courses. You, you've heard of that, that website free courses. And so just studying, mm -hmm. redefining, updating, because I went to seminary, I graduated in 1996. So a lot of what I learned from my evangelical seminary training is obsolete. And so I needed to update myself. And so I think that by updating my own theology and my own uh, relationship with God, that in turn helps me to nurture and care for uh, the members of the church 
Thank we you do. so much. Yes, ma'am. So. Thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Griffith. And uh, let me just say, I offer, and I'm sure I speak for the persons uh, uh, who are with you, we offer our condolences uh, in the passing of your family member. Uh, let, let me just ask while I have you up, uh, have you had uh, uh, courses in clinical pastoral education? When I went to seminary, they had what they call supervised. Your short answer, your short answer now. Su supervised ministry when I went to seminary, we didn't have CPE. All so right. I have not been to the new one with Dr. Wallace. I see she's looking at me. Okay. <laughs> oh, what about you, uh, uh, Dr. Helton? Have you had any uh, clinical uh, pastoral education courses? You, yes, you I have uh, okay. at Duke Medical Center. I okay. did, and I did a unit, and it was the most salvific experience of my life. Yes. Uh, you, Elder uh, Lester? Yes, ma'am. At the only uh, seminary of the CME Church, Phillips School of Theology, ITC. All right. Dr. Phillip? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. At the great ITC, Phillips School of Theology. Very good. I'm so glad to hear that because your answers denoted uh, clinical pastoral care uh, sharing with the people. Mm -hmm. And let me just add a personal note. One of the, the best things that I could have done when I retired was to go and take a unit, Dr. Helton, uh, through the advocacy program uh, here in our area, Chicago and the suburban areas in clinical pastoral care. It really freed me up, freed me up and helped me to find myself again after Amen. pastoring 25 years. With that being said, now let me ask uh, you gentlemen. Um, and you do you know Reverend Wayne Williams is on Dr. Clark. Uh, no, I don't see him. Praxis, can you uh, include uh, Dr. Wayne for me? He's, he's on the screen. He's on the screen. He's on the I, lower level. I don't see him at all on mine, but uh, 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 Dr. Um, you might need, you not, excuse me, Dr. Clark, uh, George, you may need to change your view. Uh, now, change see, view. I don't know how to do that. Um, and I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Williams, I wouldn't have left you all. You're my homeboy. No, I know, but I just want to let you know that I'm. A, I apologize to you. I'm just really just having. A, I had a funeral of my first cousin okay. uh, in Memphis, and I'm back now. But I'm uh, having two funerals back to back. Two major members that just died, and okay. I've been dealing with that because it's not. Paris Lester uh, knows that I just left Memphis, as he know on my way here, uh, because I had a funeral there we go. on down the line. But okay. I did hear you say something as it relates to. Uh, our Zoom situation and how it has really made a difference in our church. Mm -hmm. And I just want to let you know, it definitely has made a difference at Lynch Street, uh, where right. I'm pastoring. Uh, we okay. have over 55 or 60, 55 to 60 every single week. All right. But my question was, uh, in which way you were nurturing uh, your congregation during the pandemic? So mm -hmm. I, I, I think you said to me, and help me if I'm incorrect, that you you all were connected on the Zoom. Absolutely, and okay. we do it every single week. Oh, every week. 60, 60 people mm -hmm. uh, on every single week for the last 15 months. It's all been right. fantastic. And uh, I, so again, I apologize to you for being a few minutes late. I do see one of our sisters who just left Jackson, Mississippi, Dr. Brenda Wallet, uh, who was here in Jackson with us. But now, hold, hold it now, hold it. <laughs> hold, it. hold your horses, Doc. Okay. Uh, we, I appreciate what you're doing. And let me also say, uh, we offer our condolences to you. Uh, but uh, please allow me to move forward. My next question is what I need y'all to think about seriously now. And if you haven't, I hope you will do so. And that, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm starting out easy. And so I need an answer from each of you on this one too. Have you or your campaign members written any resolutions for the general conference 
coming up in 2022? I'll take a yes or no answer. Uh, who want to go first on that one? Me? I have not. Okay. Wayne Williams. Gotcha. No for Helton. No for Helton either. We have not. All no, right. No, no for Washington at this time. All right. Paris Lester, yes, we're in the process of writing one now. All she right. Said, now have you written one? We're in the process. She said now. Uh, right? uh, uh, Elder, don't you <laughs> hold on now. Leave him alone. Y'all done started already. Uh, said not. Uh, no, no, she, no, no. She put no, my answer. Yes, listen, <laughs> listen, yeah. Hold it. Let the big sister talk. I'm older than all y'all. Uh, yes, okay. <laughs> so come on, stay in your lane now. Okay, yes, uh, Dr. Yes, Griffin, have you on uh, your team? No, ma'am. All right. And let, let me let me tell you why I asked that question. I asked that question because there is what we call a white elephant uh, that's been in our church for a long time. And the white elephant is called fear. Fear to voice your opinion, fear to speak up, fear to protest, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and if you become bishop, if you become a bishop, will you allow, and I, I, I shouldn't say, even use the term, allow, will you afford the people the privilege to voice their opinion without uh, moving them from their churches? See, we, we got a lot of that going on. People are afraid to speak up in the life of our church because they don't, they feel that they might get moved if they really voice their opinion. Uh, they might get uh, uh, demoted if they really voice their opinion. So that white elephant is, 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 uh, is a part of the atmosphere. And we need, we need some kind of way that we remove that white elephant uh, out of our church without, and I'm gonna say this, without anyone feeling threatened, without anyone feeling threatened, the person that's voicing their opinion and the bishop of, uh, uh, who is over that particular district. What do you plan on doing? Or do you plan on keeping it as a business as usual? If you do something to please, displease me, I'm gonna move you uh, from your church. Uh, if, if your personality and my personality clash, uh, I'm gonna move you because I can get somebody better. That kind of spirit is lodging in our church, not only in ours, it's in others. But what do you plan on doing to move the white elephant of fear? Uh, out of the local congregation. Uh, who want to go first on that one? I'll go first. I'll yes, go sir. First. Um, I think the first thing that must be done is that it, it must be emulated and started from uh, the person, him or herself. Um, I don't mind speaking up and I encourage it. And I'm going to circle back to a prior question you asked, Dr. Uh, that's a part, George. No, answer that this is, one right here, sir. Answer this one. I know, I know, but I'm this it's all tied in. All right. Going back to CPE, what CPE allowed me to do and to be is free. And if you recall, I want to just take you back to the 2014 General Conference. When it came up for the cause of the women in our church. It was the missionaries. I stood up. It could have cost me everything I stood for. All right. And I ever worked for. Okay. And so I did. And every bishop had signed off against that. Mm -hmm. And I stood up for that. And everyone th thought and said I was foolish. And I was doing something that was um, unwise and told me to sit down, even in my delegation. Mm -hmm. afterwards but it needed to be said gotcha all right and i encourage that in my local church for my local church members to be the same way with me thank you sir uh i thank you for that answer because uh it, it was also 2014 when um the commission on the concerns of women in ministry got our portion put in the, in the uh, 
uh, and uh, the Commission on the Concerns of Women stretched in the uh, Book of Discipline. And I could not get one sister at that time to sign on that resolution with me. So I understand how that feels. So uh, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Wayne, I see your hand. What are you going to do to well, remove that elephant? I, don't I appreciate you very much. It, it does go back as you indicated, Dr. Helton, principle, standing on what you feel that is right. The older I get in age and more experience in this ministry, I mm -hmm. believe right is right and wrong is wrong. I'm going to stand on what is right, no matter what it costs me. Right. I've been in situations like this in 1990 when they wanted to eradicate, they, I'm gonna say the name, completely cut out the young adults from 18 to 35. They wanted to cut it to 18 to 22 and eradicate 201.5. That said there must be at least one young adult to the general conference from each annual conference. I stood up, rallied the young adults Together. Right. And if you remember, you were there, Dr. Carr. We, by the grace of God, won. We fought that thing against right. all odds. And the College of Bishops, let's call it out what it is, they, uh, the majority of them did not like it. And the young adults won. But I still stood on a principle. If you are in my administration as a bishop in the church, I want you to feel free. I don't want yes people around me. On my Very district, good. that's not any yet, people. People Thank speak you. in my district what they feel. You are not. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. <laughs> Wayne. You don't got caught up and you want to preach a little while. And <laughs> you not, nah, you know, I know us. We're all preachers and we can all take a piece of that soapbox. Yes, but let, let us move forward. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, uh, Elder. yes, sir. Uh, Elder Washington. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, as you, that, that is a relevant question, especially in, in today's society. So mm -hmm. we have people following after Trump who are scared. Well, I don't want to get into that, but <laughs> anyway, uh, I've always encouraged my pastors and personal parishioners uh, to make sure we engage with one another in a respectful manner. Nobody, not, it, it, we're not all going to be on everything. Mm -hmm. However, we ought to be able to respectfully listen and hear one another without a feeling of contention. Now we have to understand for progress to take place, there's gonna be some tension. Mm -hmm. There's gonna be some confrontation. There has to be in order for progress to take place. So I create not only as presiding elder, but as a pastor, an atmosphere where people are comfortable to give, whether it's, a, whether it's good or bad, mm -hmm. give your opinion. All right. And we work from there to move forward. But even right. with pastors and members in the church laity, we have to be able to address the elephant in the white room. And though we have a lot of elephants we need to address. Amen. But because Amen. Of, of fear, as you said, fear in the atmosphere where if you don't do this and say that, I, I've never been a person that backed down from anything. Mm -hmm. So here again, I create the atmosphere where persons are free to give their opinion and be respected by it. And then from there, we can move forward. But we have to create that atmosphere. Okay, and let me also uh, add on to that. Uh, in these questions, I'm not trying to be disrespectful to any of our leadership, but right, this right. is a social justice uh, platform. And I'm not going to step back. I'm not going to step back from asking, asking the hard questions that mm -hmm. must be asked on this evening. All mm -hmm. due respect to leadership. But it's time for us to evolve. It's time for us to do some things that's going to empower the church. Dr. Griffith, uh, you next, and then uh, Elder uh, Paris Lester, my homeboy. Thank you again, Dr. Essie Clark George, for another challenging but relevant question. I have always been outspoken. It is something that I practice and it is something that has gotten me in hot water a time or two. I think that in order to encourage our laity and our pastors to live an example of being able to articulate their opinions, what needs to be done is we need to create a learning environment mm -hmm. so that when people voice their opinions, they will be informed opinions and they will be opinions that can be elevated and discussed in a manner that uh, really iron sharpens iron. So one of the things that I do in my church and one of the things that I do on my district is I always make sure that people have the information they need 
in order to uh, deliberate and debate certain issues. So I think that will go a long way. Thank you so much. Uh, Elder Lester? Yes, ma'am. I think one of the greatest ways to deal with confrontation, anything of that matter, is to, first of all, come with a uh, amount of respect. I think a lot of times, as you're talking about bishops uh, using fear and other tactics, I think just as anybody else, you could go to a person in private, share respectfully, and it's amazing how things can be worked out. I think a lot of times what happens in the church, many times people, as, as Dr. Griffin said, people only have a little bit of knowledge of certain things, and then they fly off the handle. And sometimes we have a lot of ignorance that's on fire because they are not aware of what's going on. But I think if you, if you approach it in a calm manner, talking to a bishop, talking to an elder, talking to a pastor, talking to a layperson, showing respect, I believe, gets a lot of, a lot of things done. All right. Thank you very much. Let me move now to the next question. Um, this question is for you, Dr. Washington. Uh, if you are elected bishop, what would be your mission uh, financially to empower the district that you're in at the local church level? Let me, before you answer, this is a big question for the folk back home. The people back home that I share with from all over the country are all saying everything we get at this end ends up at the top. And there's no giving back from the top down. And we want, we want some bishops this time uh, to be elected that is going to uh, give back to the local churches. When local churches are without, uh, some with, who need roofs, some need sidewalks, <laughs> uh, parking lots, but they are busy under the leadership of their pastor, making sure the apportionments get paid. And in so doing, in so doing, people are upset at the local level because they are saying, and it is true, Everything goes to the top and there's nothing coming from the top down to them. How are you going to empower, my brother, the local churches in your district after you have been assigned a district by the General Conference as bishop? Let me just say this is a relevant, relevant question for today, especially during these times. We have to embrace new ways of creating economic sovereignty for our churches. First and foremost, we must continue to teach and preach and, 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 and emphasize the practice of tithing. Regardless of all we do to bring in other income to the church, we must never abandon the practice of tithing. Since God has given us a sound mind, we must use it in financial planning. Financial stability just doesn't start with tithing. We must be good stewards of what God has given us, which means investing. Just like the master when he went and left and he came back and he had the three uh, stewards and he said, well, what did you invest my money in? What did you do with it? Economic um, sovereignty should be at the forefront of the, of the church's goals. I'm in the process of working with pastors and laity in my district to develop a road to recovery plan and rebuilding, reimagining and resiliency. A major part of our approach is developing partnerships on local, state and federal levels that can leverage resources on this post-pandemic situation. Hey, now, now here's some things that I've already done and I'm doing right now as we prepare for a post-pandemic. First of all, across my ministry, I've always focused on spiritual growth, economic stability, and enlarging our territory. I've developed summer school programs for youth with programs that were fully funded and it uh, served over five, uh, over a thousand children and youth with a $5 million worth of grants and goods and services. And every dollar of those things went back into our communities to make sure it helped the churches to provide ministries in those communities. I have the knowledge and the practice of experiencing and developing faith-based partnerships mm -hmm. to provide greater access and attaining funding streams for ministry in both small and large congregations. Many times we think that our churches are too small to do ministry, but every church in every community can do something. And in most cases, they're already doing it. All right. Before the pandemic, I assisted the congregation in receiving a grant of $20,000 through a city program. I partnered with Indiana University School of Philanthropy and, and leveraged funds to do a two-day economic development training for 100. Okay, I think you went out. You, we can't hear you. 
Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, all right. I, I, I established a public and private partnerships with, with Comerica Bank, in which they underwrote a luncheon for uh, one of our spring meetings. I partnered with PNC Bank to provide child saving programs for low income families, where they were able to save funds for their children without being thrown off any benefits. All right. It's not only about tithing, but we can partner. Okay. And, and, and also have an entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial spirit. All right. To the okay. concept of a district and visual hold performing arts. Hold it right there. I think you've given us quite a bit. Um, uh, and, and I'm thankful to hear that because if you are elected bishop, Dr. Washington, the people are going to look back at this and they're going to want to want to be able to say that you promised us these programs. And I'm glad you have that in your background that you can pull it forward. But I got to. Uh, let me just say one more. One more. One more. One more. We had a 100 year celebration where the CME Church was in the state of Michigan, and we yes. raised $65,000 that went back to the local churches. I'm, but there are other things that I'm going to stop because it's that's, about that's right. you'll the local chance, church. Yeah. You'll get a chance uh, uh, to live it out if you are elected bishop. Uh, Dr. Helton, let me ask you this How do you see the CME Church ministry addressing racism today? Now, you. You're on mute, Dr. Helton. How do I see it doing what it, what you're saying currently, or how do I see it doing this in the future? Well, the I want to know. I want to know now. And you, if you want to, you can give me some future, also. Well, how, what what is your answer? How do you see the CME Church uh, uh, ministry addressing racism today? Well, uh, in Washington, D.C., I helped coordinate um, through the National Council of Churches, through W. Darren Moore, who is the AME Zion Bishop, who is now the president of the National Council of Churches. Oh, wow. or I think that's what his title is. We had a national racism conference when the senior bishop, uh, many of our bishops came, and we coalesced around um, some issues. And that was the number one issue. And um, we are now collaborating even with pastors in the city right now. And I'm hoping uh, that we can do even more with the collaboration of um, not only Methodist churches, but um, throughout all of the denominations in the United States. Um, that's what we've done. I think as we move forward with um, social justice, mm -hmm. um, you know, we did away with that human concerns piece uh, many years ago that we used to have. But I think through evangelism, I think part of evangelism uh, through perhaps uh, Dr. Moore, soon to be Dr. Moore, um, we can inculcate that into uh, evangelism, because one thing about evangelism, we have to have a, uh, a good view of who we are and understand the social climate, particularly in uh, post-Trump. All right. And, uh, we need to start to really address the resurgence. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, oh, thank you for it, and I appreciate it. Now, let me ask you, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Williams. Yes. While, listen to me now, while the civil rights movement was great at addressing sexism, it failed in addressing sexism towards Black women. Mm -hmm. How does your ministry uh, will address sexism towards Black wi women if you are elected bishop? Now, that is a really good question, but it's really a sensitive question. And I wanted you to know, uh, Dr. Clark, you're just pulling the cover off of everything today. And I'm just saying to you, I do believe that in order for us in the CME Church to move forward, everybody must be inclusive. We must be inclusive to everyone. That every, And the main thing is it relates to Black women and everybody else. But the key word is mutual respect. To me, it always has been. It's called mutual respect. Everybody deserves respect. And in my Episcopal district, if I'm elected, I will respect 
women, as I've always done and always will do, as it relates to being an integral part of my Episcopal district. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Now, Dr. Uh, and presiding elder uh, Griffin, let me ask you this question. If you are elected bishop, financially, how are you going to go back and empower them local churches? What are you gonna do once you they, we, we stand there and they lay hands on you and, and uh, you are assigned to XYZ district and all the folk in your district gonna be coming up to you and saying good things to you. What are you gonna do to help a grandma's church that needs the plumbing fix when you get back home? I mean, when you get in your district, how are you? Give me three things that you can do that you planned on doing to empower the local church and to get rid of that other uh, atmosphere, uh, one of the atmospheres in our church that everything goes to the top and ain't nothing coming back to the bottom. What you gonna do, bro? Uh, thank you again for this question. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, first of all, I am going to take an inventory, an assessment of all of the gifts and skill sets that are within the region that are at the district that I am assigned and provide that list of gifts by district, by uh, elders districts and make sure that it is available to every pastor, every lay leader. Then I am going to- uh, That was number one. Okay. Right, the second thing is I'm gonna have a working committee that would go through the district and evaluate the needs that are available. And then the third thing is to establish a schedule where those people with the necessary gifts and skills can coalesce uh, in an area and spend a weekend or a weekend every week uh, fixing, repairing, clearing, uh, doing those things that are necessary, but really using the gifts that we have in the Episcopal district. Uh, then the other thing is that I will establish an economic development committee. I wanted to say earlier that at present, when I was at Lane, we had a tutoring program that was funded by the city government. We employed uh, young people during the summer to work in that tutoring program. Uh, also at present, we have Dyer Chapel, which is totally inhabitable, uninhabitable. And we are working with the rural development uh, department to change that uh, from person thinking that it is their church uh -huh. to getting them to envision it being a community resource. All right, and thank so you very much. Thank you very much for uh, that answer. If you are elected bishop, we're gonna hold you to task uh, <laughs> to make sure that you live out those three platforms in the life of the district that God will give you. Dr. George, Dr. George. No, sir. No, sir. Just, just give me 30 no, sir, seconds. Now. No, sir. No, sir. You know I know you now. Stay yeah. with me in your lane. Hold on. I know you got some good stuff. I, I know. I see it up there, speaker, coach, and facilitators. But just hold on. Let me get to uh, uh, Elder uh, Paris Lester. Uh, Elder Lester, what Bible verse? or what biblical principles are you using in the life of the church right now as we're dealing with police brutality? What, what, what's your go-to passage, my brother? One of my favorites, uh, Reverend Clark, is George's, that from Psalm 139, uh, uh, eight, the Bible says that even if I make my bed in hell, hmm. thou art there. And I believe that we find ourselves there so many times as African-Americans uh, killing from the police, but also killing of ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be a hellish situation, but the good thing is I know that the Lord is with us to see us out of it. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much for that answer. Uh, I appreciate it, it was nice and short and we give God the glory for uh, that answer. Now, let me move over here um, to give a scenario to, oh, I need an answer from each of you on this question. Uh, uh, this, uh, let me see, how do I wanna phrase this? Not a, it's not a question, it's really um, 
um, uh, a case study. Uh, listen to this case study. Uh, a pastor comes to the age of retirement. He retires or she retires and have been faithful in making sure that for the last 35 years, uh, their apportionments of whatever church they were placed in was paid. Uh, all the uh, district and annual conference fees were paid for the last 35 years. And the church that he or she was pastoring last uh, 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 paid through their tenure at the church all of uh, their 12%. Up until the last, last uh, 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 right before retirement, I, I should say. But a check was given to the treasurer to hold um, that would pay that person's last installment of 12%. But when the new pastor came in, the new pastor said, there's no money and turned it over to the bishop for the bishop to call the retired person to tell the retired person that they're not going to get their last installment of their 12%. If you are elected bishop, would you allow a person who has worked diligently through the years, never missed apportionment? Uh, never miss meeting any kind of uh, commitment that the church had, made sure that the bishop had all of his or her uh, askings uh, for their quadrennial celebration. Would you allow that person to leave without their last installment being paid? Uh, Dr. Washington, let me start with you. As How you would know, you I, handle it if you were the bishop? Yeah, yeah. As you know, I, I've uh, worked with uh, several pastors of retirement and made sure that they received what they were supposed to receive and working with the uh, uh, Tyrone Davis and others and making sure that those funds would have been given to that person. Or, I mean, you know, make sure that person was credited for those funds that were raised during their tenure. Uh, so yes, that, that's uh, after a person has served our church, we want to make sure that they retire with dignity. Over 35 years of service, and they've given of themselves uh, in, in many ways, shapes, and forms as pastors do, it, it, we need to make sure the persons retire with dignity and that we treat them with great respect. I make sure we celebrate every pastor that, that, uh, that retires in, in my districts, as you know. Oh, yes, yes. I, I, I take Dr. that. I, yeah, yeah. Dr. Heldon, how would you handle it if you're a bishop? Now, you're at the top now, and you're looking down on a poor little pastor that's retired and didn't get all their money. Trying to understand the question, uh, Dr. George, you said if the local church paid their 12% to the treasurer, to the treasurer of the annual conference. Right. And the annual conference, the church did not have the money right then, but they gave the check in good faith that when the money came in, they would pay it. And so when the new pastor was assigned, listen, the new pastor was assigned, told the situation to the bishop and said that they did not have the money. You're the bishop now. What you going to do to help that pastor that have been faithful up until retirement? Well, what would you do? What is your uh, specialty? In, well, in the well, the first thing I would do is to make sure I'm not setting a false precedence. Mm -hmm. So the first thing in my mind would be uh, what type of precedence would I be setting? Because the word would get around not only to that annual conference, but to multiple annual conferences. And it could be a plethora of such incidences coming. So I would make sure that I would cover myself for that. Um, in the event that a local church gave a check and asked the annual conference to hold it, I'm the joint board chair now. Oh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Not to the uh, not to the annual conference. Their district uh, treasurer was supposed to be holding the check until the money turned around in the local church. The local church was responsible for that uh, pastor's twelve percent to get paid. 
but the local church new leader said they did not have it right then and turned the situation over to the bishop for the bishop to handle. Uh, if it's during the, a, a session of the annual conference, hypothetically, I would um, no, it wasn't bring that up. The annual conference. At that time, the money was supposed to be already in to the treasurer. It was, it was passed, I'm told. So it was, it was post annual conference or pre annual it was conference? After the annual con uh, it was after the annual conference. Post. So it was post annual conference. Mm -hmm. um, again, I would I would make sure that I'm not setting a false precedent. And what does that mean? Help me with that. What does that, that mean? That means that I would not want to set a standard that I could not uphold in the future. All right. I would not want to do that because I would be held accountable um, after that if I allowed that to take place. So I would probably look at how that could be handled and I would work with that presiding elder to work with that pastor. If that local church voted to do that, then they would need to be reminded of what they agreed to do. Very good. And I would work from, it, from that perspective. That's good. Uh, Dr. Uh... Uh, Williams, your uh, answer to that question Thank of you, your Clark. Thank you. I think uh, I, I want to say Dr. Helton's uh, statement is right on as it relates to setting president. Even though you know my platform is a servant leader with a compassionate heart. Yes. I'm compassionate. That is my platform as relates to who I am and always have been. But we do have to be very careful mm -hmm. about that. One of the things on the joint board, I was chair uh, as Dr. Helton knows, for years in the Carolina region. And as a chair of the Joint Board, I've had situations like that. And where, but I talked to the pastor about it. And the pastor, and actually the bishop brings it back to me and said, okay, what do you want to do? And then I know that I'm somewhat responsible for that. So I think you need to take it on a case to case basis. Very good. Uh, if you do it on a case to case basis, uh, that would somewhat get us out of some hot water. But I do believe what Dr. Elton said, we have to be very careful of the precedence it set. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Clark. Uh, you're welcome. Just keep in mind now, this is somebody that have served the church for 30 years and uh, uh, at 35 years, and, and they want their monies to go on into retirement with. So uh, just know- You're saying that we're holding the money up let me hear no, the no. last part, please. No, 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 not no. I think Helton, uh, Dr. Helton helped us with it when he said he would make sure that that responsibility goes back to that local church. Mm -hmm. And that local church live out that commitment that they made. Absolutely. Now, I think I done answered it, so I can't even go there no more. Uh, to ask uh, Dr. Griffin, unless you are, uh, Dr. Griffin, uh, you are presiding elder. Uh, Lester, have some different you want to add, but I would, I would, I would just simply say uh, I would just pay it, make okay. sure it's paid, and then work it out. Uh, make sure it's paid out of some of that money that coming to the top. Well, that's, I mean the annual, the annual conference would cover it, and then I would I would meet with that pastor in church to find out what's going on. That's the short answer. Oh, that, which is a wonderful answer. Because after 35 years, after 35 years, I, I would trust that person that he, they wouldn't lie to me and I would just pay it and then meet with the church and, and pastor. Thank you so much for that answer. That's a good answer. Dr. Griffin, you have anything different you'd like to add? I don't think I could add anything better or more valuable than that, that which has been said, except to say in my district, I do not hold checks. I do not take checks to hold, and anything that is due the annual conference, it does not go in my district treasury. It goes directly to the annual conference treasurer because our pensions are due in December. And so when those pensions are due, I make sure that they are there and that the annual conference treasurer can write the check and send it to the Episcopal district and that those pensions are paid. So I try to follow the law as it pertains to these types of things. All right. Thank you so much for your answer. 
Now, let me move uh, to uh, another question. Uh, in, in the life of, of the church as we see it, um, I don't know how to word this one, and, and yet I got two pages of questions. Uh, but let me just uh, let me let me say it this way: There are some sisters in the life of the church who feel as if, and who thinks as if, there are two churches: one for men and one for women. So if you are elected bishop in the life of the church, what are you going to do to uh, show forth uh, equality for all in every capacity in the life of the church in, in terms of pastoring, in terms of being a presiding elder, uh, in terms of uh, uh, any positions, your administrator, well, what are you going to do a uh, 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 um, uh, presiding elder Paris Lester, what would you do to bring about equality for sisters in the life of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church? And before you answer, let me say, you if you're a bishop, you inherit the book of discipline just like all the rest of us. So it's all of our faults to not bring about some clarity for everybody. So I just need to say that. So I'm not dumping on, on, on men. I'm just saying oppression is a part of where we are. And we need to do something about removing the oppression. Your, your answer, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. George. I would, I would simply point to persons like you oh. uh, who I watch uh, pastor, who I watch the presiding elders. We have, uh, of course, Bishop uh, Jefferson Snorton, uh, I would point to those persons as a reason why I would want to appoint uh, females to certain pastors. So it wouldn't be a matter of this is a male church or a female church, but going under the godly wisdom of saying that this person, I believe through godly wisdom, that this person will be a good pastor for this particular church, or this person would be a good presiding elder for this district and not basing it on gender. And I think though I, I could again point to so many, even in our church that I've watched over the years and to see how uh, so many of our sisters have been elevated across our church. Many of our churches, our leading churches have female pastors in them now. And it is, it is a joy and delight. Many of our presiding elders are female. So it's, it's great. And even now in uh, Birmingham, Alabama, Miles College has its first female president. So there are many things I could point to. And then being in Chicago, and you know this very well, one of the most dynamic pastors in Chicago was Johnny Coleman. I mean, who built the church from the ground up and paid it off when she walked into it, a female. So there are many instances in person that I can point to to say, it does not matter about gender. It matters about if the person is qualified for the position. All right, but we're All talking right. about gender right now. Uh, no, I thank what, you for that wonderful, sophisticated answer. That's a good answer, but that's not reality in our church for where but, sisters are concerned. Uh, but I, but I, I thought you were asking me as a bishop, what would I do? Oh, oh I, I know, but you went to Johnny Coleman, so you left me. You left me when you went no, to Johnny. So, I was just, I was just point, I'm just pointing, pointing out that there are many instances where I, I know in a church, as you're talking about this, there are some churches that say, well. We don't want a female pastor. And I, I used her as an example of saying, why not? There are many instances okay. where women have definitely flourished All as right. pastors. All right. Thank you very much for, for that clarification. All right. Uh, let me move now to talk about salary. Here's what, um, well, let me see how am I going to say this. Uh, Someone reported to me that um, generally, generally, with, hear me good now, before expenses, before expenses, uh, most of our bishops um, uh, have access to over $500,000 before expenses. 
And when we look in the book of disciplines, a pastor salary before expenses is $16,000. If you are elected bishop, are you willing to uh, look at uh, your district and try to re-itemize a salary salaries for pastors uh, 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 let me let me let me let you answer that first because I don't want to confuse nobody sixteen thousand dollars now I do know the flow that a pastor has to go and sit with the steward and studesses and they work out salary but the discipline says sixteen thousand dollars so who want to take a shot at this? before I move forward. What do you plan on doing? Are you willing to get in what uh, they're calling on the uh, uh, Congressman Ms. 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 Uh, Lewis's uh, good trouble? Are you willing to get into some good trouble to afford a pastor a uh, decent salary and housing and hospitalization, et cetera, travel, uh, and, rem and get that $16,000 removed out of the Book of Disciplines? Uh, Dr. Clark, uh, I would like to answer, if you would. Go right ahead. Me, and first and foremost of all, we would certainly, those who, of us who are sensitive, and I think on this floor, would certainly want to bring that up as a resolution. I uh -huh. totally agree with you with the $16,000. That is really ridiculous. All and right, thank you so much. Do, Thank you so much. Let me let me move on now with the same. I need to ask this of each of you because I'm looking at the five of you. And for all I know, all three of y'all might be bishop. The sisters are saying some different, of course. But um, there's going, there might be a bishop here. And I want to be able to have you look at this uh, from a, a sensitive position some say the reason why our young folk are, are going into chaplaincy is because of the lack of a, a good package that's uh, uh, for them, like there is a package laid out in the Book of Disciplines for the bishops. So who want to go next and, and, and answer me? How are you going to help a pastor who has, let me let, let you answer, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ricky. I think that's a very challenging question um, in terms of doing what the United Methodist Church does and, does and have a, uh, a, sal a salary uh, minimum. <clears throat> the United Methodist Church has 200 years on us in terms of history and they are a dominant population. Um, realistically in the African-American church, uh, we really need to grapple with a minimum salary, uh, particularly when you have churches that are falling down and need uh, repair. So there, there's a lot of, there are a lot of things you have to look at with regard to that. Um, so I don't know, I don't know how that could be answered by any of us to say that we will mandate that $16,000 be given to every pastor. I don't think that that's conceivable, um, but it's something that we can work towards in terms of helping each pastor um, get a decent salary. And I think that's tied into Dr. Uh, George with a prior question about what will we do about economic development? I think all of that's tied in together and it has to be intertwined to help these local churches and pastors develop better uh, income streams to help the local pastors. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Clark George. I will say from the outset that $16,000 in today's world is pitiful. I would think that this church would be seeking innovative ways. We have a college of bishops, great minds around the table. And I believe that if this became a priority of the general conference and the church, 
that we could work with all of the minds in our church to ensure that when we ask young pastors, male and female, to go to ITC, to become doctors of ministry, that we would ensure that they were compensated, that they would not be a burden to the church where they are appointed, and that they could depend on the connectional church augmenting salaries where the people may not be able to do all that we ask them to do. And so I would uh, hopefully, as a part of the college, take on an initiative to try to get something done about salaries for our pastors so that they will remain in our Zion where we need them the most. All right, uh, Dr. Washington. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Clark George. Again, uh, let me just add on to what my brothers have said. Uh, it would have to be done on an individual basis. I believe looking at every congregation individually, some congregations can't afford a $16,000 salary, as, as you well know. Uh, however, it, it starts with looking at economic stability as the church as a whole, where in which we've been able to maybe augment or su supplement the salaries of those pastors. But it can be done, but it has to start with looking at the finances of the church, making some cuts, making uh, some additions in other places, some great investments. Uh, but yes, something needs to be done about those. That, that salary, 16000 is on the poverty level. So again, um, it's something we can't say we can just mandate right away, but it's going to take some time to make sure we, we move into making sure that persons are able to, to sustain themselves as they pass our congregations. Uh, so yes, we need to work on that uh, right away, so to speak, as, a, as uh, others have said. Uh, that's all I can add on to it at this time, but it needs to be where we can provide a salary that people can, can, can live upon, some type of living wage. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Williams, did I call on you for that question? Yeah, you... you, you, you All right, y'all taking me so me, fast but... here. Uh, you did answer that one for yeah, me? Yeah, I answered it a little bit, but you know, you didn't let me get into it a little bit. You told me, but I didn't answer what you said. What did you leave out? What well, you... what I left out was in terms of the resolution that the resolution would have to come from the general conference and the bishop, the college of bishops, those who are on here, the, the bishops that are on here, not on here, would come together, particularly these candidates, would come together along with the college of bishops and talk about it. We'd get a resolution on the floor and we would raise that 16,000 up and it would be a minimum of that $30,000. And then we'll say, how are we gonna get that 30,000? Then we'll kick in with community economic development in our respective Episcopal district. But it needs to be done in the discipline so that the minimum can go up to where it needs to be. And if that doesn't work and you only have a handful, then the, then the Episcopal district through community and economic development will assist those churches. Thank you, thank, you, thank you so much for that. And if I cut you short, I got a little happy there somewhere uh, in, in the process. I didn't really mean to. Uh, I know it cut you short, but I got a little caught up because you said the magic word, the book of disciplines. If what we're talking about tonight, <laughs> all of these questions don't mean a hill of beans if it's not in our laws because people are going to refer us back to the laws. Now, that's the other white elephant. If it's not in the book of disciplines, there is a way out. So that is why I asked the question earlier, have you written any resolutions? Uh, you or your team, or if you're planning on writing some, because uh, as you and I both know, our churches are getting thinner and thinner in terms of membership. And it's all because we got these white elephants that we talk about in private circles, but we don't talk about in public settings because we don't want to ruffle any feathers, but it is ruffle feather time now, y'all. Uh, you got to be, in my opinion, if you are elected bishop, you got to be a revolutionary bishop like Jesus was a revolutionary when he came and grew up uh, in his time. We got to have change so that the church don't die. Just going along to get along ain't going to work no more. So therefore, we need resolutions written 
uh, in the life of the church by candidates and your team that's going to help bring about changes. Because, you know, as you and I both know, we're just talking right now. If it's not in the discipline, it ain't going nowhere. If it's not in the book, or if you don't turn in some resolution to the resolution committee, and, and uh, so it can at least get in the book, and then to the to the to the uh, small group settings that we go to, and hopefully pass that and on to the floor, so that we can argue and debate about this. Which brings me to another question: What is your stance on the uh, queer community, which is better uh, derived as the LGBTQ, and some say IA community? What is what is your stance? Because it's Pride Month here in Chicago, and everywhere we look. We see the rainbow uh, colors, and on the other hand, we see the, the transgender uh, colors. It's Pride Month uh, in our state. How do you see yourself as a bishop dealing with the LGBTQIA uh, or the queer, queer X, that's the new term, Queer X community, I learned this week. Queer X community, which in, which deals with all forms of, of sexual preferences, same sex, gender, as well as trans. What are we going to do now, y'all? How are we going to deal with this? Because it's right here in our face. Hello, Dr. Washington? <laughs> I'm going to deal with them the same way we deal with the drunken community. The who? Uh, the, the, the alcoholic community, the same way we deal with the adultery community, the same way we deal with the drug community. We're going to love them. We're going to love them. We're going to love them. All right. That's all, all right. I can say about it. We're going to love them. All right. That's your answer. Okay. Let, let me hear what you got to say, uh, uh, Elder uh, Lester. What are you going to do? Well, gonna... As, as uh, Elder Washington just said, continue to love them. But also I think in that same fight in the Q community, the uh, the, the African Americans that are still mistreated uh, as gays and being African American. So I think uh, joining in that struggle that even in acceptance uh, by the larger community, treating them fairly, I think the fight continues where black lives continue to matter even when you're uh, LBG or whatever the alphabet is, whatever you are, uh, that that you should be treated with respect and love. And also, right. Doctor, I didn't get a chance to answer the, the money question, but uh, I'll move on. <laughs> All right, then. Go ahead. Answer the money question. I, I, was just, I, I was just going to say that I think as, as a bishop, and I agree, everything we have put in the, in the uh, discipline, but I think as a bishop, as a leader, certain churches, we just have to help them. Uh, if those pastors... If the churches can't afford it, then we have to help supplement them. But at the same time, we require work out of that pastor, not just, just to be collecting a check, but uh, they, they have to show that they work to earn these resources. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right, you, you, you got me, but uh, let me move on. Who did not answer that question I just asked about the, about the QX community? Yes, uh, uh, Dr. Griffith, go right ahead. At uh, Rock of Ages CME Church in Augusta, Georgia, one of my, I think it was my third church, I had a musician who was a part of that community and I was made aware. And so I met with him and we discussed uh, who he was and how he could live among us as a viable member of the church. We agreed that he would not uh, do anything that would harm the children that he would not uh, flirt or make advances with people attending worship, people who were members of the church. We agreed that he would be just as holy as everyone else. But I was particularly sensitive to the fact that uh, in the LGBTQIA community, us. us saying that we are gonna lump them and treat them like we do alcoholics and all of that, I think we need to get a little bit more particular because of all of the atrocities that are being committed, that have been committed for this community. And of course, if they're black, that becomes a great issue because most of us do serve the black community. So I would like to see uh, 
I would like to see our church address uh, their roles as pastors, as uh, bishops, as lay leaders, as Sunday school teachers. I would like to see how we might develop what Dr. King called the beloved community, where mutual respect and yet safety could be upheld and everyone would feel a part of this community known as the African-American community. I, I think I hear you saying there's space for everyone. Exactly. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, Dr. Helton? Um, I'll just and say all one word. Please excuse me, and all positions. Am I right, Dr. Griffith, is that what you're saying? In yeah. all positions, thank you very much. Dr. Helton, I'm sorry. Yeah, I believe in inclusivity. And I think that says it all. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. All right. All right. Thank you so very much, gentlemen. Now, let me go to um, uh, let me go back to the female situation uh, in the life of our church, life of our church. Um, would you uh, give me your views? on if you're not, um, well, let me see how do I want to say this without getting in some whole, a whole heap of trouble. Let me, let me just, let me go here and say this. So many people have been wounded by the church. So they say, how do you do evangelism during a time of our church, uh, around wounded individuals. Uh, uh, Presiding Elder Lester, how do you deal with this uh, uh, community of wounded church people around evangelism? What would be your plight? How would you handle that? Thank you. I, again, go back to seminary. Uh, um, I believe it's Henry now and the uh, wounded healer, uh, uh, being able to reach them with those principles. Um, and I, I do understand being wounded. I think all of us have had times in the church where we have been wounded by either uh, clergy or lay, uh, but yet we have to learn how to remain steadfast in this. And that old adage is true. Many times hurt people hurt people. So we have to have to love them, treat them, show them respect, uh, let them as we're called to do, to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. And that, that takes on a whole nother role as a bishop of saying that you can get to be with them. Uh, I remember in, in seminary, uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Haney taught us that in worship is really withness, mm -hmm. that we have to be with people. That that's how we really worship is withness, that we have to be there with people and being there with them when they hurt. All right, uh, let me move to Dr. Washington. Wounded individuals. How you deal with all these folks in the church talking about they hurt? Somebody hurt them. First, we have to engage. In other words, we got to meet them where they are and don't belittle their hurt. Ah. Um, see, it's important. Sometimes we overlook their hurt and we just try to rush them through it. But you got to meet them where they are, even experience it, feel their pain, and then yeah. help them to realize that it, it wasn't for their destruction, but it was to empower them to become uh, uh, better people, better Christians, uh, to serve God's community. So we meet them where they are, empower them to overcome that situation and circumstance, and then to enlarge their territory, engage in power and law. So again, it's about meeting them where they are, because people are hurting on all levels of the church. But we've got to be able to meet them where they are, and then, go, and then give them the word of God and move forward. Dr. Helton? I think we need to um, all confess oh. that we all have been wounded. Yes. And uh, I don't think there's anything wrong with being wounded. Mm -hmm. It's not what happens to you. Mm -hmm. It's how you respond mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. what happens to mm -hmm. you. And I think we need to teach people how to process mm -hmm. their pain. I am big on process. I am a process person. Mm -hmm. And so if you can process carefully and sensitive, sensitively uh, your pain, then we can all work through our several different uh, areas of pain. There's not a person on this call who has not experienced pain. 
and woundedness. So it's teaching people how to process it and how to deal with it and how to allow uh, victory to come through whatever we have experienced. And that is a tough endeavor to bring about, but it is something that can be achievable. Okay, all right, uh, Dr. Williams. Thank you so very much. And I totally agree with everybody on this call. I'm reminded of a professor. Actually, she was not even a bishop when I was at the IPC. And the first woman bishop, Dr. Vestai McKenzie, not without a struggle by Dr. Vestai McKenzie. And she dealt with struggle. And one of the things that we as pastors, in order to deal with wounded people, you're right, brother, this on this call. They need to see that we are real. Who do we think we are? You see the glory, but you don't know my story. So I began to tell them about some of my wounded experiences and people then, some of the people will begin to say, hey, I understand this person is real. This person has gone through the same thing that I've gone, that I'm going through. So I think it's so important that we really get down to the nitty gritty to show people who we really are so that we can make them comfortable and they will begin to trust us when they're wounded. And then once they can understand our situation, we'll try to work through it together. And last but not least, if we can't help them as pastors, we need to learn how to refer. We need to ah. learn how to refer in pastoral care. We need to know this as far as I can go, and now I'm going to refer you to persons who have the license to carry your problem. Very good. Amen. Did I ask you this question, Dr. Um, uh, Griffith? I... Uh, no, ma'am, but I All will right, take... but then let me Let me hear what you got to say, bro. All right. I would, uh, when you mentioned how would we make this a part of evangelism, I just want to point back to the last general conference. There were several ministries uh, presented to the general conference. Those resolutions were approved that uh, recommended and mandated local churches have uh, ministries for wounded persons in the congregation and in the community. So as a bishop, I would ensure that my district did in fact have those types of ministries available and that uh, they were going to be equipped with people who are trained to deal in those areas and would be able to do so with a, a worldview that meets the standards of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. But the other uh, suggestions and ideas were quite thorough. I don't need to add anything to that that has been said by my colleagues, but I definitely would go back to the discipline. They are in the discipline. And I came back and I started one at Lewis Temple. So I know that they are necessary because people are using them. All right, very good. Harry, I want to talk um, a little bit um, uh, to you, um, uh, presiding elder Lester. What is your biblical foundational um, found your biblical foundational uh, for 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 your mission statement if you are elected bishop? Thank you. Uh, it's been James 5, 16, the effectual and fervent prayers of the righteous avail of much. And our mantra has been uh, prayerful leadership, recognizing that it's only through prayer, as Jesus says, that certain things will be accomplished. That's through fasting and praying. And I do recognize the power of prayer, that prayer is what generates the power that we need mm -hmm. to be bishops, mm -hmm. to be pastors, elders, and the like that uh, as one of the bishops I heard said that many things that we can do in life, but to be successful, you can't do life successfully without prayer. So prayer has been a big part of my life and a big part of this campaign because I recognize that it is the effectual and fervent prayers of the righteous that avails much. All right, same question, uh, Dr. Williams. Thank you so very much. I believe in a threefold situation. Uh -huh. that, uh, we, when it comes down to a mission statement, I believe that, that when it comes down, we need to deal with discipleship, making disciples one by one in the 21st century, in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, 
seeing Christ in everything we do. Acts chapter 5, 38, if it's not of God, it'll fail. But if it is of God, you can't stop it. And last but not least, Second Chronicles 19, 7, everybody is somebody. Dr. Helton. Uh, my mission statement, I just finished doing a little article about last week. It's Matthew 23 and 11, the greatest among you should be your servant. Mm. Uh, Dr. Washington. You're muted, bro. Uh, can you, can you can hear me now? I'm yes, sorry, sir. thank you very much. Matthew 28, uh, 19, of course, uh, the Great Commission, go ye into all the world, uh, dealing with engage, empower, and enlarge. All right. Um, who did I miss? Anyone? Oh, I did you again. I'm sorry, Elder. Go right ahead. Mine uh, is likewise, Dr. Washington, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And then also the scripture that says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. All right. All right. Okay. Uh, here is a scenario for you. Two same-sex individuals knock on your office and you invite them in. They're members of your congregation. And they tell you they want to get married. Don't everybody raise their hand at the same time. What are you going to do with this situation? Dr. Washington. It, well, I would just share with them, I, you know, our discipline does not give me that authority or the power to marry them. Uh, so as I'm not uh, putting them down, I'm not discouraging them for what they're doing, I'm not disrespecting them, but I don't have the authority to, to perform that kind of wedding. All right. Uh, 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 Elder Lester? Yes, ma'am. I, I would do the same thing, but right. I, I would also uh, meet with them. Uh, to share, you know, to share with them. All right. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Helton? Yes, I pose this question um, to uh, some persons in our church, and their response was the same thing that uh, we've heard, and oh. uh, that would be what I would respond to. I would respond to it legally, but I would deal with it morally on my own. Ah. Oh. And, and can't you break that out for me a little bit? I would not perform the ceremony. All right. I can say that flat out. Okay. But I would, I would as I have already, um, yes. talk to persons and invite them into uh, my church. And that's, that's something that I've already done. Very good. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Washington, Dr. Uh, Williams. Yes, and I would do the same thing in terms of the discipline first, because there's nothing we can do as, we, as bishops, we must follow the dictate of the discipline. But then I would certainly talk to those individuals. And I have, as you have done, Dr. Hilton and others, invited them to my church. And they did not take that personally because they knew my heart, uh, the heart of the pastor. But they, they knew I was confined also to the deacon elder full connection. And in this case, it would have been consecrated a bishop in the CME church. Thank you. Elder Griffin. Yes, uh, thank you again. I would uh, meet with them because I would see this as an opportunity for evangelism. Mm -hmm. I would meet with them and go over with them the faith, the Christian faith, what uh, we stand on being our word of God and the discipline of our church and answer any questions they would have as to the position of our church and as it is relative to what has happened in the government, uh, having these things legalized and try my best to make sure that they understand that the church has a role to play in the world and that these are our positions and that until they are changed, uh, we're gonna try to uphold them However, I would let them know that there are other people in the community and other places where they could uh, consummate their marriage if they chose to do so. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I think I got everyone on that. Uh, 
particular question. Did I not? Did I cover everyone? Uh, come on, talk back to me. Did everyone yes. answer that question? Yes. yes. Uh, yes. Right. Very good. Very, very good. Yes. Then um, let me let me move from there to go back. Um, uh, uh, go to rather uh, senior citizens. Uh, I have heard different persons refer um, um, to yeah, well, the term they use now, old adults, not senior citizens, old adults. Um, if you are elected bishop uh, in the life of the CME church, um, how would you empower persons over 70? What kind of ways would you empower persons over 70 in the life of your district? How would you give them some go ahead, some I got you in your district? Uh, Elder uh, Washington, and make a short question. I answer, wasn't it? First, I would empower them with Season Saint Ministries, as well as mentor, uh, encourage them to mentor some of our other uh, officers and members that are coming along in the church. So we give them a, a seat at the table, so to speak, where their voices can be heard and they realize that they are still valuable to the conference and to the churches. Dr. Helton? I would say what I'm doing already, um, I'm a member of our senior citizens um, group we have at, the, at our church. Um, we call them the young and heart. And I go out with them and I, um, we do all kinds of festivities, ride trains and do everything together. So it's a very nurturing group. And I would be a very nurturing bishop to that population because I hope I can live long enough to be a part of that population myself. Praise the Lord. Elder, uh, uh, presiding elder uh, Williams. Yes, and uh, I, I, I believe I have an affinity for seniors in my church. We do a lot of great things together. And uh, in my last church back in, in uh, Durham, North Carolina, I would ride and do, as Dr. Helton said and others, ride and do so many fun things with them. I would keep them engaged because if the truth is told, if, if we don't nurture that group, we can pretty much almost hang it up because I don't know about the rest of you all. I don't have a problem saying it. It's this crowd. It's that crowd. It's that the people of God. It's that Laos. It's that crowd there that, that, that helps to keep every month the lights, gas, and water, and everything else on. And, and if I, I don't want to alienate at all that crowd, because that crowd, again, with their set fixed income, those are the person who are committed to this church when a whole lot of others are not. All right. Uh, presiding Elder uh, Paris Lester. Yes, ma'am. I will commit to being on Praxis Circle Network. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> celebrating with my sister in retirement and encouraging them. Uh, I, I think one great thing that uh, this pandemic has definitely done, especially for that group, many of them, and I, I know in our church, are now on Facebook, are on YouTube because of the pandemic when they were once afraid of the technology, they're now embracing it. So I, I count it a privilege uh, to, to be with them because you learn so much from them. Uh, not, not much that I can really offer them, but so much they can offer to me, especially in the life of this church and in ministry and uh, being the sage that I think we all need. I think a, a large part of the reason why we have so much calamity in families is because we have, we have kicked aside so many of those seniors, placed them in nursing homes and other places. Whereas I remember in, in, our, in our family, my grandmother stayed with us until she died. So she was a sage of our family to help us along the way. So yeah, we definitely need them and to empower them. Uh, youth and young adults are fleeing, uh, not only our Zion, but all over. They are saying they don't need this no more. They, they, they don't want to go to church as we call church. And with the pandemic, uh, 
it really gave them a great excuse. What are we going to do, gentlemen, to draw the youth and young adults back into the life of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church? In what way, uh, Dr. Washington, uh, would you give me two, two things that you would do to draw youth and young adult back into the life of the CME Church? Just two things, Doc. Dr. Washington. Excuse me, uh, Elder, I, I, I'm still in an annual conference. Uh, so I, I just, I, give, give me the question again. The question is, what would you do uh, to draw youth and young adults back into the life of the Christian Methodist? Thank you. Uh, first of all, we have to make sure that we utilize the gifts and talents of our youth and young adults. Too often they've been put on the back your, burner. Turn off your, your, your phone. Your, uh -huh. Thank you. I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. That's all right. You, you know I got to be at your conference. <laughs> uh, first of all, as I said, we want to utilize the gifts and talents of our uh, youth and young adults as well. Uh, they are persons that are running corporations, uh, businesses, and we have to utilize their gifts and their talents. And their talents, instead of telling them, wait your turn, or this is a pecking order, instead of just using what God has given them to be a blessing to the church. And what's happening is they're being trained, and then they go to these other denominations, which put them to work. And they were uh, a generation that likes to work. They're not going to sit still. And, you know, we tell them, well, you pray on the wait on it. No, they are ready and willing to work. And we have to utilize their gifts and talents through the different ministries that are taking place in our church and just encourage them instead of trying to hold them back. Dr. Helton? I was um, trying to toggle on because... Um, Bishop William just recognized all the candidates. Yes, so, I know. Um, <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm balancing. I know you're double so, That's good. That's good. Yeah, so you're showing that's us your, the, your bishop skills. <laughs> yeah, so I, I just made sure that he knew I was on that as well. But I think the question, I wrote your question down to um, uh, dealing with young adults. Is that correct? Youth and young yeah. adults. What are you going to do Youth. once you become bishop to bring them back into the life of the church? Yes, I would like to do, uh, I think you said two things. One of all, one yeah. is something that I did uh, when the young adults had me on a panel discussion. I um, told them that I would create a forum where they could feel inclusive with regard to the annual conference. Mm -hmm. And they need to know that they can be heard. And I would create a, a forum where mm -hmm. they could be heard and that they would have a voice and I would want to meet with them. Okay. And um, I would secondly support the Board of Christian Education and all of their endeavors and see what we could do as, a, as an annual conference mm -hmm. to empower them in their schools and in their several um, locales and try to support the local church mm -hmm. in all of that and see what we could do also to help with scholarships. All right. Because if we miss that, uh, Dr. George, um, we really gonna miss out. And uh, my daughter um, got that four year scholarship um, from our church through the missionary. And God knows how much that helped me and my wife. I know that's right. Dr. Uh, Elder uh, Lester, what you got to say on this? How are we gonna draw youth and young adults back in the church? Well, I, thank you again. I think one, one thing is definitely involving them and again i think we the pandemic has helped uh me in a, a unique way in of reaching them where they are they are on the internet they are online uh whereas the church we we have to begin to look at what are the ways in which we can reach them uh by having one hour worship services mm. making sure that the music is exciting and inviting mm. and reaching them because now one thing the pandemic has done is level the playing field that all of us have the opportunity on Sunday to engage our youth, young adults, adults, all online. But what are we presenting online? Is it something that they want to watch? Is it is it catching them? Is the worship service as such that they want to be a part of it? So even in the midst of the pandemic, many people now are getting vaccinated and want to come back to worship. But are they able to watch your worship on, online and see that it's exciting and engaging? That'll, that'll make them want to come and be a part of your worship service, even in person. All right. Thank you very much, uh, 
uh, uh, Dr. Griffith, did I include you or did I leave you out again? You left me out. Come on with it then. <laughs> what are you going to do? I, I am going to, first of all, ensure that young adults in my region or Episcopal District are appointed to the ecumenical bodies that deal with social justice and support them with the resources that they need to be viable members of those groups and that they might come back and uh, establish committees uh, throughout the Episcopal District to activate the concerns of those bodies as it pertains to young adults, mm -hmm. particularly the NAACP's youth and young adult branch now are very active uh, in politics and in social justice issues. So I wanna make sure that those who are young adults are on the front line. I would also support those that are involved in agencies that we're not so familiar with, such as Black Lives Matter and other agencies. So I would like to see the young adults bring to the table those things that are of interest to them and then distribute them to those platforms where they can have a voice. Very good. Thank you so much for that answer. Let me share something with you, gentlemen. I know for a fact that another mainline denomination during this pandemic and their general conference gave all of their churches a 25% discount on their apportionments. Sure it is. If you are elected bishop, let's just talk about your district. If you are elected bishop and we face another pandemic like we have gone through, uh, do you think you're going to be equipped enough to find a way to empower the local churches in time of that pandemic? Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Williams. And you said empower the local church. Yes, sir. Financially. Oh, what are you going to Yes, sir. Financially. I, let me want me to repeat it. There was a mainline denomination, mainline, that gave their entire uh, church a 25% discount on their apportionment during this pandemic. In case we face another pandemic in your district because I know you can't speak for the whole denomination, but you can speak for your district. You have a lot of longitude and latitude as a bishop. What would you do to empower the local churches, that 130 some odd churches, that 200 some odd churches that you will have under your banner during uh, a new pandemic? What would you well, do to empower them? That, that, that? That's one of the things starting now that I would do since you said that there will be another pandemic is that we will empower them by simply indicating community and economic development. I would do those kinds of things that if there's ever any type of problems like that, we would have that to offset that, those expenses through that process. It's just no reason that we should not have those kinds of things in the Episcopal District. I believe it was you, Dr. Washington, who said that. It's just no way we should do that so that we can have, when that pandemic comes up again, we will be prepared to take care of our own. We won't have to wait for the federal government to go ahead and do what they're gonna do, but we need to start doing some things, not only nonprofit, but I'm just convinced that we need to start some for profit. All right, very good. <laughs> so I assume that you're talking local, state, and federal right. funding. Is right. that right? Right. Okay, all right. Same question, Dr. Um, uh, Griffin. Well, I certainly want to say that uh, I appreciate what uh, Elder Williams just said. I believe that wholeheartedly with the new economic development initiative that we are beginning, that we should have funds in place to address that. Uh, it was in the 2018, I believe it was, where Bishop Bobby Best gave the Episcopal address. And one of the items in that address was adjusting apportionment to reflect our present reality for smaller churches. Mm. And I would say for all churches, because yeah. there's ministry that has to be done despite what your apportionment might be. 
but I think we need to go back and pick up that tenant uh, because I'm being asked throughout my district and this Louisiana region, when are you gonna adjust the budget? We were there, we were delegates. We heard the church say after the general conference, we're gonna get together and we're going to adjust these budgets to reflect the present reality of the churches. And to date, uh, we have not done so. So I think we really need to just have integrity and what we say we're gonna do, do it. And that will go a long way in helping the local church. Now let's let's talk a subject called stress. Uh, uh, no, I won't. I won't lift that bishop up because uh, I see him exercising, and I see him cooking his meals on Facebook, showing us that he's eating healthy. But I also know that you can get so caught up in the work that you forget to do some self care kind of situations and, and, and not cause your district uh, to be afraid of you uh, leaving ahead of time. We all say we want to go to heaven uh, and that's, that's our goal. But while we're here, God has placed us in these temples and we should take care of these temples. So as, as you move forward in, in your campaign, as well as, again, when you become bishop, what are you going to do to do some strenuous self-care that you take care of yourself? Because see, a doctor, a sick doctor cannot care for his or her patient. So what are you going to do to nurture your body during uh, your tenure as bishop? And now, because we need you to campaign hard, but what you're going to do to care for yourself? Uh, let me start with Dr. Helton. Uh, I think that's um, something that we should be practicing now. Um, and that is stressing going to the doctor regularly. You know, I have... Um, Appointments next week. Um, uh, eye doctor, uh, medical doctor, uh, internist, mm -hmm. um, dentist. Mm -hmm. I think we need to start practicing that on a regular basis. Um, one of the things about the Black church, um, we don't have a healthy lifestyle as a Black church. Mm -hmm. So um, I know one of the things that my wife and I have already talked about. Uh, to keep up a rigorous schedule, and I've talked to a lot of the bishops, you know, your diet has to be um, curtailed. All right. And um, so that's one of the things I'm starting to do now um, and is uh, trying to eat a lot more wholesome and get exercise in. Um, I'm supposed to get at least 30 minutes a day, 150 minutes a week mm -hmm. uh, at least. So that's what I'm trying to do now. And it is something that requires a lot of discipline to do. And so I'm trying to do that now. All right. Self care, Elder Lester, what are you going to do and what are you doing, sir, to care for yourself? Well, I, I, I learned this um, rule number one, don't sweat the small stuff. Rule number two is all small stuff that we have to get to a point where we have to recognize that we, we love our work, but we also have to love ourselves. Uh, I think the adage goes, you've got to come apart before you come apart. So taking that, that time to ourselves, and I think, again, it goes back to the, the, the prayerful leadership about having that time in prayer and meditation helps me in terms of God leading me those areas of my life where I do need uh, to do better in terms of eating, in terms of exercising, in terms of just rest, I think that's one thing. More than anything else, uh, we need rest. And uh, even 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 what we're doing today, uh, mm -hmm. what they're noticing in the midst of this pandemic, is that people who sit down in front of a computer six to eight hours a day, it's equivalent to smoking a pack of cigarettes a day. So we we have to we have to do things. I, I know myself. I, I ordered a, a desk that stands up, so you you can do certain things. That, start putting in practice now to give ourselves a more healthier lifestyle. But one thing is 
I, I try to ascribe to is a prayer and meditation and definitely getting some rest. All right, Elder uh, 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 Williams. Thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. uh, stress, so glad you asked that question because stress will kill you. Stress will kill you. And we have to find that balance. I do believe in dealing with exercise and watching our food intake because you're such a you're in such a hurry all of the time and you're just swallowing stuff so quick and just moving so quick and before you know it, uh, you're not taking care of yourself. And when you are gone, what are you going to have to preside over? My thing is, we've got to learn how to how to take care of ourselves. And you said it best, like, uh, Brother uh, Lester, not to sweat the small stuff. And last but not least, we got to have that meditation uh, uh, with the Lord. We've got to, uh, you know, have the, no matter what else, we got to have that meditation time. And one of the things we learned at ITC with Dr. Mafico is dealing with this whole notion of Sabbath. You got to take your Sabbath. It's okay. hard sometimes for us to get there. One time we went to Jerusalem right after seminary and we could not even use our titles. Only thing we could use is our name and take two weeks off in Jerusalem. And he was Timba Mafiko and I was Wayne Williams. We Very had to start good. getting in touch with ourselves. And, and when we- Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank oh. you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Uh, uh, Dr. Griffin? Because I, I know Dr. La Dr. Wayne, he'll go on and, you know, he'll preach on us. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Uh, Dr. Griffin? <laughs> well, I echo all the sentiments of my colleagues. But one addition that helps with stress, when you delegate authority, uh, empower the person to whom you delegate with the authority to make decisions so that you are not micromanaging every facet of your administration. I, that has reduced a tremendous amount of stress in my life. And I thank God for the team that I have working with me, both at the local level and in the district, because they know they are empowered to make decisions. And so I think that is a great way to reduce stress. Dr. Washington? Again, let me just, again, let me just add on to what my brothers have said. Uh, yes, radical self-care is a part of social justice. We must take care of ourselves. We must meditate, have some meditation time, some downtime. And also not only uh, we should have some, but encourage our pastors and, and members also to do the same thing as well. I'm blessed to have a, a, a wonderful wife who helps me with my downtime. There are times where she just takes the phone from me. So you won't be answering no calls this day. And you just take just take the time and, and eat right, uh, as person has said. Uh, but it's important to have self-care. Thank you, sir. Uh, gentlemen, it is 8.02 um, Central Time. I am so grateful that you have shared out of your hearts tonight. You have shared uh, uh, with us. And um, as I told you, once we hang up, everybody and their mama all across the country is going to be looking at your answers. And I pray that if you are elected bishop that you would live up to what you have shared with us uh, on this evening. Uh, final remarks, your mission statement. Just add two things from each of you that you would like to see take place in the life of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church when you are elected bishop. Dr. Helton. I would like for the semi church to become more fiscally sound and more sensitive, was well, more fiscally sound and more inclusive. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Williams. Thank you so very much. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. And uh, I would do the same as Dr. In, in terms of what Dr. Helton said to move this out the way. I'm sorry, but I have to listen into. But the bottom line is, I would be more, would want the church to be fiscally sound and to make sure that everybody, once again, is treated like human beings. Just treat people like you want to be treated, and it'll work every time. Mutual respect. Thank you. Elder Lester. <laughs> Thank you again. I would just hope that we would continue to do as a CME church, that we would continue to uh, work hard and reaching social price. But also, uh, we have a great history with our four colleges. 
of educating African Americans across America that we will continue to strive to support all of our HBCUs of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Elder Griffith. I would like to see the church do what it said it would do as it pertains to the apportionment of our churches. And I would like to see the young adults treated as adults. Thank Those you very people. much. Elder Washington. Again, I would like to see the church engage, empower, and enlarge our territory. Very good. Thank you, sirs. I want to again um, salute you. And for all we know, we're looking at bishops. And again, I thank you for your sharing your answers on this evening. I pray for your great success, that God will continue to empower you and embolden you to be the person that God would have you be in the life of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. Your sister, Essie Clark George, is praying for you. Thank Good you. night. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank outstanding. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Dr. George, what's your website? You said we can go visit. Praxis. Uh, Praxis, <laughs> Praxis Circle Ecumenical uh, Ministry. Pra no, what did I say? Practice Circle Network Ecumenical Ministry. Yeah, dot org or dot com? Uh, dot org. California. Praxis Circle Network Ecumenical Ministry. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity, and I, I, I will support the ministry. Well, blessing you, uh, my brother. Same here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, brother. Same here. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you so, thank you so much. much, homegirl. Right. I enjoyed y'all. Y'all were good. I appreciate it. Good, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.